Sorry, a lot of technical issues getting started here, but I really appreciate everyone's patience. And I could not agree more with the fact that people need to talk more about seed, work more with seed. I definitely think it's one of those things that's a little bit daunting, right? It's kind of taking your gardening passion a little bit to, to the next level because the real difference with, between cultivating seeds, especially in a, a partially controlled setting like your backyard, greenhouse, or, or what have you, uh, it requires just a lot more diligent care um, and almost on a daily basis tending to these uh, young young organisms. So uh, I commend people for wanting to start out. Um, it's also information that can be used uh, to a large degree for in-field sowing. Mostly what we're gonna be talking today about is kind of sowing in containers. Um, so thank you to CMPS, thank you to the Naturehood series. Uh, I think this is a great idea and kind of bringing people together to talk about gardening something that Theodore Payne Foundation is always in support of. Um, I've been working at the Theodore Payne Foundation for 12 years, um, and in that time have done quite a bit of seed propagation, but I, I still consider myself a beginner in some respects. You know, there's always new, do things challenging me or those stubborn species that you have yet to kind of, uh, kind of unlock. And I, that's one thing you'll hear me say, it's a metaphor, you know, seeds are like locks and, and getting the right key to unlock that seed and get it to imbibe and germinate, uh, you know, it's it's very satisfying once you do achieve that. And so it's definitely a lifelong pursuit. Um, so yeah, uh, just kind of getting right into to things. The class outline, we're going to look into kind of the definition of a seed. What is a seed? How did it evolve? Where did it come from? the benefits uh, and drawbacks of propagating from seed. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can propagate plants. Some are easier than others. Um, seed propagation of particular uh, difficult to grow uh, species is probably up there in terms of if you lumped all the types of uh, propagation together, some of the most difficult to accomplish. Um, we're gonna talk about what you need to propagate seeds. So the equipment supplies, conditions uh, and really using Theodore Payne's nursery, which does grow something somewhere around 100 to 120,000 plants a year, which we sell through our retail space in Sun Valley, California. Um, and many of those are produced from seeds. So this class or this lecture is really based around kind of my personal experience in Sun Valley. And that's the other thing about seed propagation, so anecdotal. I'll read something that someone did and they had to do these complex things and I just scattered seed on some media, threw some water on it and, and it worked. So, you know, always experiment. That is the key, always experiment. Uh, we're gonna look at scarification, stratification, what do those things mean? Some technique for seed sowing, timing of seed uh, propagation. And then we're going to look into something that's, I think, often overlooked a little bit in seed classes is like, what do you do after? You know, there's this follow up. They, they, you know, once they've germinated, what do you do? How do you handle that material? So kind of sharing some, some, some information on how to, how to kind of continue their care through, through time. And then just looking at some resources. And I will be sharing in the chat box and I can do it actually right now, if you guys want um just to kind of get it on there uh i was gonna share let's see the files that i'm going to use and some resources i just want to give you guys out the gate that um this information so don't forget um so i'm going to create a link right now and i'll put that in the chat box and there's a pdf of the powerpoint um Okay, as well as some other resources. Anyone on the internet with this link can view, copy link. Okay. Also, I like to say that seeds are a plant with a packed lunch ready to go. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. <laughs> okay. It has everything you need for a plant to grow and more. So. Oh yeah. Okay, back to it. You guys still can see the... Uh, PowerPoint, 
Yeah. Still screen sharing, cool. So defining and understanding seeds, what is a seed, right? It's, they're not very old things, geologically speaking, or when you look at the age of, you know, the universe, but if you just are looking at earth and life on earth, they're relative newcomers. What it really is, it's an embryonic plant. It's enclosed and secure and it has some nutrients. And we'll talk about why that kind of that packed nutrients and that security through a seed coat evolved over time, but it's waiting for the right conditions to germinate. We've all heard stories, you know, seeds unearthed in, in jars preserved and they germinate or just look at our fire ecology in uh, California, what happens after a big fire seeds that have been waiting and our obligate seeders are going to be triggered by that fire and all those nutrients and resources and that reduction in comp competition to grow, germinate, grow and reproduce often a lot of annuals in particular. Who, who makes seeds? Well, they're produced by both angiosperms, the flowering plants and the gymnosperms, cone bearing plants. Uh, we do have uh, you think of those mostly being conifers, uh, ginkgos, side cads. We also have some interesting uh, gymnosperms, Thamnosa montana, the, in the citrus family, which I believe is, uh, or sorry, sorry, ephedra, pardon me, ephedra. Um, that's a, a really cool gymnosperm. That's more of a shrub that we grow. Um, Thamnosa montana is an angiosperm in the, in the citrus family. So these are both known as spermatophytes or seed producing individuals. On the right there of this image, you can see that's a, a pinus, uh, it's the pinion pine, pinus edulis, um, which you can see that actually the seed coat is still clinging to two of those really bizarre cotyledons and, and down in the ground when the root radical is right below that cluster of first new leaves. I just love the photo of that. It's almost something like you would see at the bottom of the ocean. Why did seeds evolve in the first place? Well, it was selection pressures including an increasingly arid terrestrial environment uh, and more favorable atmosphere. So basically the, the types of organisms uh, producing spores really needed wet environments. They needed continually moist environments for spores to be able to conduct the process necessary to reproduce new individuals. Whereas seeds, basically that aridity pushed organisms to evolve an adaptation to withstand long periods of drought which we're all very familiar with that um, kind of concept, I think, particularly California native plant growers, you know, like things go dormant in the summer. And so seeds in and of themselves are kind of this adaptation. They're able to put a taproot down deep very quickly to get to moisture in the soil. They have a nutrient pack in the seed itself to assist with the development of uh, their vegetation on top of another, a, a number of other uh, um, kind of adaptations, uh, the ability to grow large uh, kind of stems through a uh, vascular system, so on and so forth. So when did this all happen? Well, bryophytes are kind of earliest terrestrial plant ancestors, mosses, liverworts, colonizing land half a billion years ago hundred million years of evolution and selection pressures, we have tracheophytes or plants that have a vascular system and can become quite large, but they're still producing, reproducing through spores. About 350 million years ago, another 50 million years ago, the kind of development of gymnast forms. So they are producing seeds. Again, these are conifers, ginkgo, side cads, still kind of an ancient flora, um, all during kind of this carboniferous period. Um, and thinking about it, you know, I was in, in reading about the atmosphere and how it's changing over time and the fact that fire wasn't possible on, on, on land until there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere. And just thinking about our ecologies and plant communities, which are so dependent on fire and how that could only really happen after those millions of years of accumulation of, of oxygen in the atmosphere, because oxygen clearly is a part of that combustion process. Uh, and that return of carbon back to the soil through, through fires. Yeah, it's really interesting. And then 180 million years ago, we see the first fossil records of angiosperms, of flowering plants, and it's an explosion, right? Seed plants come to dominate almost every 
uh, ecology on Earth. You know, they're they're really critical to kind of all systems. Um, and obviously, this explosion with insect diversity and just pushing kind of these different ways of pollination and speciation through the last 180 million years. And, you know, that we talk about pollination a little bit in this class, but there are so many different ways that angiosperms um, have come to become pollinated. And it's such a fascinating line of inquiry to, to learn about how plants do get pollinated. Um, simply put, you know, pollen grain, which is really three uh, cells adheres to a sigma, develops a pollen tube that goes down into an ovule. And then uh, you can see actually this really close up picture, this macro of a, I think it's an Echinocereus anglemanii. Um, sorry about the helicopter, LA outside life. Um, I know how that goes. Sometimes in Oakland, we play that game too. It's either battle the helicopters or a one-year-old and a three-year-old for the crowd. So I thought I'd battle the outside elements. So uh, thank you for your patience while I muted that. So this is a real close-up uh, cactus flower. You can actually see the stamens kind of unfurling ar around that eruption of the pistil with all those different uh, stigma and you can see all the pollen grains all on the base of the petal and even some that have stuck to the stigma already so um, and so in angiosperms you know that seed is developed inside uh, of an ovary a vessel um, and it's enclosed and in gymnosperms it really literally means naked seed the ovule seed is exposed and I had a had an open pinus quad quadra quadrinaris or can't remember the species open on my desk, which I had been letting sit in a in a bag so that when it hissed and the, the seeds came out, I could collect it. Uh, but I think people understand that concept. So some of the benefits and drawbacks of propagating from seed, uh, you know, and that's kind of when you when you desire to have some plants or some plant material, you know, how are you going to produce it? It's really important. So pros copious amount of plants if done right. Genetic diversity. Uh, clones, which is what you often see in the nursery, are clonal because they want to preserve the exact genetic information of either a hybrid from the garden or a mutant from out in the wild. Um, seed grown really affords you diversity and um, for some plants, it's really the only way. I don't know if it's a, that's a pro or a con, but it is the only way for some species. I can think of like uh, you know, Hespero, Yucca, Whiplii, the Chaparral, Yucca, I really don't see even that to, as a viable option for tissue culture. Really, the only way is to grow from seed. And it's heckin' fun. Um, it really is. You know, I've been propagating plants 12 years at TPF plus another three on a farm, and it never gets old. It's still really, really fun to grow plants from seed. Um, talk about copious quantities of seed, the red arrow pointing to a Dudleya seed. They are very, very small. And so one single 17 by 17 flat can yield hundreds of individuals you can see here potted up. Um, and floral diversity, right? That's, I think there's nothing more exquisite than walking through a post burn field and there's like 40 varieties of uh, Calicortis plumerae. Um, and in order to kind of harness some of that genetic diversity and beauty, a, as a grower and a horticulturist, because we're always looking for a unique thing with then to clone. Um, but there's also just beauty in seeing what the world has created through its own processes of pollination and fertilization. And um, in botanic gardens in particular, you know, where you have a lot of species crammed into a small spot, and there's the LA parrots, you guys got all the flavors of LA. Um, where there's a, a lot of different species and you're kind of producing this unnatural system where there's cross-pollination happening between species, you know, it's, it's really uh, critical for the development of new introductions and things like that to harvest that seed and grow it out and observe them to see if there's any genetic diversity. I love how on all these pictures, there's a, there's a pollinator in almost every single one. So this was just on a walk through the Santa Monica Mountains. 
near Red Rocks off of Old Topanga Canyon Road. I bet these are peaking right now in Santa Monica's. And just for fun, this is uh, in the post burn of the Woolsey fire, just like walking along the trail and calicordis and all lilies really only seed produced. Some of them will, they're true bulbs, so they will produce little offsets. Look how many there are. Right there in that frame, there's like 150. Um, and they're like two feet tall. All that nutrient, all that carbon and potassium just drop down to the soil, no light competition. They're all just living under the chaparral waiting. Such a cool system. Obviously devastating silver lining plant nerds, mega silver lining. Um, lilies, yeah, there's, uh, so you just saw some calicordis, which we grow, I've probably grown and propagated 15 different species, and we have Fritillaria biflora on the left, uh, another, another chopper. You also see the Delphinium Cardinal, another one only from seed. So um, yeah, lilies, got to do it from seed. I love seeing this, the difference in that, look how far down that, that, that fritillary went, that fritillary by flora, the chocolate lily squared, which is gonna be in a much more xeric environment, more open. I think of the lilium, this is lilium Humboldtii, which we grow and sell. You can still see the, the old seed coat right there on the right. Uh, that's a little bit more canyon, canyon country, cooler. Although it is Zurich in the garden, we have someone on the garden tour has like dozens under the understory of his oak tree. So just cool to see the different life forms within the same genus. Cons, you know, it can be slow to some degree. Uh, look at the sow date on this Dudleya pulvriolenta, our local like chalk fat Dudleya. If you want a native one, go with the pulvriolenta a lot. You see Bretonia a lot. That's a great one too. It's more Baja. So it was sown on 2-19-2021, which is frankly a late date for a Dudley or so. And then it wasn't potted up until 12-30-21. And that's probably because by the time this Dudley of Pulvriolenta was ready to pot up sometime in June or July, I probably just said push it back until the winter because if we pot up Dudley in July, August, we might fry them because we're going to have to bear root them. Um, they require diligent care. Like I said, every day, you know, you got to be a helicopter parent. You got to be kind of neurotic, at least in the beginning, particularly. Um, you just want to see what's going on and every site's different, you know, so yeah, it's, it's really critical. And throughout the year, your site might, may change, you know, uh, with sunlight and, and, um, and wind conditions, whatever. Uh, it can be super difficult to germinate some species, like I said earlier. And a lot of times we just go and do vegetative propagation when we can't do something from seed. Uh, this isn't a difficult to germinate one, but it's uh, it's a slower one for sure. This is Berberis nivinii, our local uh, Berberis. So this, I love seeing little seeds germinate on the palm. Kind of gives you a little idea of scale with the little root radical me coming out. Uh, so. I sowed these ones on the bottom left image in a community flat, probably in November, and they just got potted up like last week. So that's that's three, four, whatever, six months as a seedling in a seedling flat before you can even get it out. Um, but that one needs a long chill. And then it's a really slow grower. You know, I'm gonna have to keep it in there for at least six or seven months as a liner, and then another six or seven months as a one gallon. So. Um, you can see this, the picture in the upper left was a picture taken today. Such a good habitat plant. So tough, very slow. The slower, the tougher though. Um, look at the bristle cone pine. There we go. Sometimes you just got to throw in a picture of a seedling germinating. It's, a, it's an enceliopsis from seed donated by someone who had one. Now I have one flowering. I think CMPS should uh, know that plant, right? That's, uh, you guys familiar with that one? Should be. So there's some plants that uh, 
<laughs> you got if you guys come down, I'll give you one. You got to come down to LA and pick it up though. You take a picture with it. Um, there's a reason to come visit. Like we didn't the, have that already. <laughs> So there's some other reasons, right? Cultivars, you can't, well, you can produce, you can produce their seed offspring, but it won't come true. It won't appear like the, the like the parent. So, you know, Cicerinchium California skies on the left here, you'd have to divide that. Um, Salvia aromis, one of the many cultivars of the Salvia Clevelandii leucophila hybrid zone, you know, we have to produce that vegetatively. Um, and, you know, you're going to be faced with options. You know, the crop on the left here, that's Anamopsis californica, the Yerba Monsa, really cool desert water seep dweller, does really well in Southern California. It's definitely a riparian plant, though, so you need to have some water on it, which is going to be difficult with the new water restrictions, at least down here. Um, so that was a crop that we divided straight out of the ground. And... Um, and potted that up probably like three months ago. And on the upper right, you can see a, a seed crop of that grown. And I took that picture today and I sowed that sometime. I don't know if someone can zoom in on that. 121, 22. So that took four or five months to get to pot up stage. But what I found fascinating, it already produced stolons. So this plant actually produced stolons, which are above ground stems that root at the node and not at the inner node um, and rhizome. So it has these thick fleshy roots, stems, which you can use to propagate. But look, it already threw adventitious rooting. See right near my nail, those kind of like little red nubbins, it's already producing vegetatively itself, which I think is just a really crazy thing. It's definitely nutrient packed since we add some slow release fertilizer, but I thought that was pretty crazy how quickly it is ready to colonize an area. So equipment, supplies, conditions needed to germinate seed. Um, so this is where we grow all of our seed, except for one other shadier house where I do my bulb seed propagation. Um, so it's not even really a greenhouse. It's not huge. You know, I think it's 60 by 30 or something, you know, it's um, maybe smaller than that, actually. But um, it's all on tables. We do have the plastics, and that is even in our arid Southern California, you know, there was times in the, this, even this past winter. I think Tim, if you want to go ahead and try to talk through the chopper, some folks said that they didn't really hear it. All right. I don't know how loud it picks yeah, up. Yeah, I don't think it's too loud. If you want to just, if you don't mind. So you see, we have the plastic roof and even in our arid Southern California uh, winters, you know, we get rain in these big deluges where it's like three inches or four inches and, you know, oversaturation of media while you've sown seed can be kind of detrimental depending on what you're growing. And then also the, the kind of unchecked rain can dislodge seed, especially if it's like a heavy downpour. Um, and we have all kind of shade cloth around the edges. So that keeps out uh you know keeps out the riffraff the the birds and the squirrels that would kind of do damage to seeds i really like the open sides and our southern california temperatures a fully enclosed greenhouse while it would expand some of our growing season and afford us some nice controls it would just get so hot in the summer we'd have to do active cooling and ventilation so this with the shade it just cools and just replicating something close to this in the backyard is sufficient um oh who's my little helper did not clean the algae off so uh you won't well ventilated off the ground helps but it's not part particularly critical the temperatures at, at ground level level are a little actually less variable which is favorable for some species and the temperatures off the ground are fluctuate more which is favorable for other species ergonomically it's really nice it's easier to water um you want good light uh, you don't want too shady for a number of reasons. Just media stays too wet. You can have pathogen issues. Um, you'll have etiolation, which is the kind of lengthening of the hypocotyl, which is the between the first cotyledons and the, and the soil, as opposed to the epicotyl, which is above the cotyledons, and that will elongate and kind of get messed up. Um, clean surfaces, algae, 
it's not particularly like pathogenic per se, but it's kind of a nuisance. It's just slippery on a concrete floor. One thing I experimented with this year to get a jump start on the Asclepius season, which is like everyone goes crazy. They have to, you know, you need the milkweed as early as possible, but it's a warm season grower. Really, you don't, if you're just relying on ambient air temperature to, to heat your to soil to the 70 to 75 degrees it needs to germinate, then you got to wait till like March, April, and you might get it to germinate earlier, but it's going to be lethargic. So what I told you earlier, we can't really like, we don't have any active heating in that polytunnel greenhouse scenario. So I modified our uh, um, warm uh, bench warmers, which is basically hot water that's pumped through this black tubing you can see in this upper right corner picture. And so I laid a piece of styrofoam, put that black uh, tubing, which has hot water pumping it through on a closed circuit. Then I covered it in pumice. And then I put my uh, Asclepius flats on top and then cover them with plastic dome to really create a greenhouse effect, which again, I don't have that greenhouse. I can't get it hot in January or February. So, you know, I think we started the crop in February and we've been cropping it, like selling finished plants and had finished plants really quick. You can see, look at all that root mass coming out. They really like it, that warmth and then just being on that gravel bed really just radiates heat. So, you know, created conditions to get an earlier crop, super fun little thing, costs like a, well, the whole system's more expensive, but uh, you can do a rudimentary one of these with electric heat mats for like 150 bucks. Um, containers, I use all these containers. Uh, in the upper portion there, you we have the different community flats they're called. One's a shallower seed flat, one's a deep flat, and they're used for different purposes and for different species. Species like a lot of our, my bulbs also directly into the deep flats. And all my other species that I would use for a community flat, I would do in that shallower one. You can see the picture on the bottom right corner. You can kind of see the depths of the different containers. Um, so we have two inch, four inch tree bands, tubes, D40s, one gallons. And it's all really about and this is all putting a seed straight into one of these different containers. So I will put a seed directly into one gallon, but it's pretty much only Aeschylus, the Buckeye. Um, I would also consider doing like a Quercus if it was a fast enough species like Quercus agrifolia. I would also consider doing a walnut in a, in a one gallon, but I really like walnuts and Quercus in the D40L, which is you can see even taller than the one gallon. It really accommodates the tap root. So I'll do, all sorts of and we'll talk about different uh, containers later um so just to kind of get the parlance of the of the industry so those are plug trays in the bottom and i we rely heavily on plug trays that's probably our most commonly used container it's the most work up front in terms of filling them but it's the least amount of work on the back end when you have a finished plug tray, you just pull them out and plop them in. And you can go from a 128, for the gardener, you could do it straight into your garden. We go from a 128 to a one gallon um, or a 72 to a one gallon or a 128 to a four inch. It's very versatile um, and it's easy. Um, media, you're gonna need media. Um, we use Berger, Berger from the Canadian side um so they just have different mixes um anytime you find um peat moss it can be substituted for coconut coir as a alternative i don't know if i want to say greener i mean it's just how you measure things um i think you definitely destruction of ecosystems that take thousands of years is horrible but so are coconut plantations that get and all of our coconut coir comes from southeast asia so you know it's just the industry as a whole needs to really have uh, funds for research and development to more sustainable materials because everything's extractive. I mean, it doesn't matter what nursery you buy from, it's extractive at some level. So you got to be really good at growing so you don't waste soil. <laughs> That's the best approach to not having to throw soil away or have to reuse it, which is not advisable unless you sterilize it. Um, you see the perlite and the vermiculite right there kind of tucked in the middle. Um, 
So I just like these mixes, which you can buy online. I, I have the resource there at the end of this, which is also on the PDF. You can buy in little three cubic foot ba um, bags. We buy these large bales and break it up. And one of these larger bales fills like 30 or 40 of the 128. So you get a lot of product out of one bale. Um, and you can see on the left is the BM2, which is their seed germination mix, which we use all in the 128s. And you kind of want to match the size of the media or the that's kind of um, its particle size in general. And you can see just from this picture, it's smaller. It'll fill that tray nicely. And as you go with larger container, you want to use a chunkier, more coarse media. So the BM6 in the center here, you can kind of just see visually bigger chunks of perlite. And then on the far right is our proprietary mix, which goes a step further, adding more mineral content like sand, um, as well as more chunky organic matter like bark. Um, and we will sow plants directly into the soil mix, which we use to just produce plants. Same mix you can buy from our nursery. Um, it's versatile enough to do that. But in the greenhouse, I keep it pretty exclusively, these prepackaged mixes, just for uniformity of dry down. Um, Watering, this is like the best, one of the best watering wands out there. The Wonder Water. Um, I just bought this. I love it. Uh, if you have a high pressure system, you might want to drop it. It's very gentle. Um, if you really need to water like a lot of plants all at once, just use a dram nozzle. That's that red nozzle. Um, but I love this thing. You can, it has a little turn off valve. You can't see it. Another fun little tool, you know, that's the other, it's like a, such a hobbyist thing. There's so many little tools and knickknacks um, to, to play around with, with seed culture in general. It's really fun thing to get obsessed with. These are, this is a great little tool if you're doing mass volumes of, of um, plug trays and this is a dibbler or a de-lodger. And you see, these are a bunch of little dowels basically just glued in there. And what it does for me is it makes the holes in the 128 so I can protect my manicure, and not have to put holes in there myself. It's, it's beneath me. No, it is probably just as fast, but you can just do a punch really quickly. Um, and you can see that that's a dibble. That's the technical word is to dibble. Um, just make a little hole where you drop the seed and either leave it covered or uncovered. Um, and you're gonna need viable seed. Uh, viable seed is usually filled edge to edge, like a full complete, unit whitish to yellowish with moist tissue it shouldn't feel crap crumbly or cracking um and if you're kind of unsure uh we actually do run a really cool class seed collection at tpf where you can kind of learn hands-on about uh seed collection and viability and that's kind of one the element i left out of this class the most is kind of seed collection which i do a little bit of um but um you know these are kind of diagnostic tools to help you determine if a seed, there's the float test. So that's with like acorns and tree seeds. Um, and if they float, they're not viable. And that's usually because a weevil is drilled in there and created an air bubble space to make it float. So when you do that with acorns, the, any of the Quercus species, you throw them in a tub of water and sow the sinkers. I hope I'm right about that. I always get confused. Um, so, are there any significant discolor, uh, um, you know, tan seed usually if all the other ones are black, just looking for patterns, you know, um, if anyone are smaller. On collection wise, one thing that I picked up is that if most of a plant has dehissed or like dispersed its seed and there's still some left on there, that like retained seed is usually not good. Um, but I, Part of me, you know, it's not always intuitive that a seed is right, but go with your gut. And then when in doubt, I'm going to show you actually a resource. A volunteer at California Botanic Garden has photographed like almost every seed of California native plants. So you will, can always have a reference for a good viable seed, at least aesthetically what it looks like. So if all these things are right, you should get germination. Um, you can kind of see this process very rudimentary essentially kind of understanding what's going on. Sometimes you will need to orient the seed correctly on larger seed to make sure that that radical is actually aimed down. I've even kind of turned, if things are kind of askew, I'll actually literally dig out the seedling and replant it to make sure it's going in. But 
getting this terminology down is, is helpful. So um, on to the next topic, which is really fascinating. It's the scarification, stratification technique and timing of seed propagation. So breaking dormancy, and again, a seed is an embryo waiting for the right conditions. It's a lock, you need the right keys. And so breaking the dormancy is like getting the right key or the right sequence of processes in order to unlock that germination. So it, it really is just a time capsule, which is just, it's crazy to think about seeds as just this way to prolong this, uh, uh, a species life. Um, so it can go through so many decades of unfavorable uh, conditions and then just be waiting for that right time. Um, and just kind of, yeah, in that state of suspension, it's really beautiful. Um, so its function is to preserve the seed. Now there is definitely DNA degradation over years of, of a seed's life, or there can be, there's been kind of evidence showing that over time, but that's just true of all life. All life breaks down, you know, entropy. So, you know, DNA, uh, you know, mutates and breaks down over time. Um, and so there's two different kinds of dormancy that you see. You kind of see seed code dormancy and you see internal dormancy. Um, <clears throat> you can see right in this photo, you had some plants that definitely had some both seed coat dormancy potentially and some internal dormancy with the calisthesia, which I have noticed I've had much better luck scarifying with sandpaper or hot water. And then you add adenostoma fasciculatum, which is both a re-sprouter after a fire as well as a, a reseeder. And so I've always had the best luck with that plant doing a using what's called a, a proprietary smoke treatment thing called Cape Smoke Primer. And you can see all these different materials which help induce scarification. And some of these are that seed coat scarification, so sandpaper. And a lot of times it's based thinking about like either these kind of general needs based on plant family, like all, almost all Fabaceae plants appreciate either a hot water soak or a scarification, as well as Malvaceae, the cotton family. Um, and a lot of these kind of obligate cedars that only come up after a fire really appreciate the super smoke plus cape seed primer for better results from germinating seeds too, um, which is developed from South Africa because they also have kind of, you know, these proteas and other things that require um, a, a fire event in order to germinate. And then you also have gibberellic acid, which is a naturally occurring chemical discovered by Japanese plant pathologist, you can read in this little article that I still have from a long time ago. And then the illicit looking baggie is what the gibberellic acid is. It's actually synthesized and that can stimulate germination and really difficult <clears throat> no, for very difficult to grow species. And knowing when to use any of these things is based on a number of, of factors. Personal experience, what your last boss told you to do, what's recommended by the seed grower or the seed seller, I should say, um, and your own intuition. I mean, that's all you have to really to run on, as well as kind of understanding, again, looking into the life history of that, that species and a step farther where that species was taken from the provenance, right? Because a lot of species have huge ranges. So you know, and for, for the case of sandpaper, you know, and takes Pharalsia ambigua, which is a plant that grows in like desert sandy washes with really hot temperatures. And, you know, I, I know from experience that you sandpaper that species, but I could see how that getting kind of tumbled in the desert sands is kind of a mechanism for that to kind of wear the seed coat down over time. So the plants producing seed on a yearly basis and they're continually getting abraded and enough of them are doing it every year. So when the favorable rains come, they'll germinate. Um, and maybe they get abraded to the point of not being viable. Who knows uh, how long a uh, Sphorelsi ambiguous seed stays viable, but I know the ones we buy are commercially grown and likely not stored for very long. Uh, I've used gibberellic acid for like sumac species and uh, penstemon. Um, and Plantagenaceae family, I think I'm right on that. Um, but you know, that's a good one when you have no luck with anything, just throwing some gibberellic acid on and some small dilution can potentially work. So that's kind of the scarification 
zone and then this is stratification so this is just a <clears throat> a freezer which i've used you can actually see this little thermostatic probe going in there i picked that up from my uh, beer brewing days where it's a lager of beer you have to control the temperature for extended period of time and a digital thermostat freezer a lot more expensive than just buying a regular freezer turning it all the way to cold and then just using this thermostat to keep it at around 38 to 40 degrees which just so happens <clears throat> is the temperature of most people's refrigerators. So you can do a little cold stratification. You can see these little four inch pots where I have <coughs> plants in cold stratification definitely fit on the edge. And cold stratification is also an internal dormancy thing where the plant needs to go through that experience of a, a cold, wet winter in order to germinate, which um, depending on where that species naturally goes, could be one month, could be two months, could be three months, could be even longer. And some species require like this alternating cold, hot, cold to germinate. Um, I, I haven't gotten so adventurous as to try that. Um, and this is more of that Pinus edulis. Remember that first one you saw with the octopus? That's that's those seedlings coming out of cold stratification. In that instance, I just put them in a bag, like a little cellophane, cellophane baggie with perlite. You can see they're just lightly moistened, not sogging wet at all, um, because too wet can cause molds, just, just a little damp. Um, and as soon as I get the root radical out, you plant them in the tree band or the D40 or some other tube. These are now only like, this is a picture from like, two or three years ago they're only like this big it's such a slow tree but that's cool um cold stratification i did a little side-by-side -side experiment just for fun this is a, a species of asclepius i think it's asclepius californica um and i think you guess which one's not cold stratified uh the upper one was just left outside and the one on the bottom was cold stratified in the fridge for like 60 days and there's definitely a striking difference so but you know i'll tell you sometimes i do the same thing and it changes you know they're just like no nah, not going to do it this year but maybe that's a seed if stored goes into deep deeper dormancy state and needs a longer cold stratification i don't know it's all mystery it's great so general process for sowing seed and i kind of extract in the next couple of slides um for this monarch kit that we're doing, but we're no longer using these biodegradable trays. They just see like the, the idea is beautiful, but in practice, they just like break down too easily. But you know, it's good for this example, it still works the same. And all these principles are the same, particularly when I talk about compaction. So we have BM2, <clears throat> we have our little plug tray. You fill the plug tray and what you do is you pack it down. You really wanna pack media down into the tray because it's been loosened by you kind of either working in the fertilizer or adding the moisture, you know, it kind of gets light. And so you want to recompact. If it's not compact, the soil, the soil, the media will literally drain out the bottom. It won't hold moisture. You'll run into a lot of issues. So you want it packed fairly tight. We use the plug trays. We fill one and then we just use another one to push down. So you can see me refilling and repacking and then you brush it all off. In this instance, we were just using this kind of ebb and flow tray, if you will, where we just filled up this tray with water. You really want to pre-water all of your media, like soak it. So after you fill the media, use the watering wand until it's dripping out the bottom. That way, when you sow, you see the final watering pass, just one quick one to kind of seal the deal. Um, you can see I just sown some Achillea mellifolium, a really easy to grow perennial. You can see how many I've sown in order to kind of um, uh, make sure I get like a nice fat cluster. And then I'm covering the seed with a little bit of the same media. So it's not much more complicated than that. Uh, you know, mostly the time is prep. So just talking about, so we've talked about media and trays, different seeds, uh, different species. But a, one of the biggest questions I get is how do I know what seed to do for what media and I think the size of the seed relative to the tray is kind of informative. Plus a couple of these notes, I think are just good baseline rules to follow. When if you're deciding, you know, have the seed, do I sow it in a big tray, a little plug tray, et cetera, so on and so forth. I think in general home gardeners, 
just the community flats make a little bit more sense because they hold more moisture and um but you know you can divide up a 128 or a plug tray with like five different species also it just kind of whatever works um so small size so what are good for those big shallow or big um shallow community flats really small size seed you saw the dudleya seed so dudleyas are tiny artemisia kekielas these are really small seed that it would take a really long time and be very difficult just to get a few plants in each little cell <clears throat> and you'd have to spend a lot of time thinning or pulling out extra seeds um so you saw that flat of anemopsis you know the community flats are really easy just to like hit with water they hold water longer so if you're going to have it there for a really long time it's just like an easier thing to manage in some ways than the 128. um seeds that may have included a pre-treatment rendering the seed a little hard to handle so when you have wet seed which is what happens after you use the cape smoke primer because it's in a water solution it's all wet so my trick is that i take that water i get a like a cup of sand, I pour all the seed and sand and uh, seed into the sand with a bit of the water. And then to homogenize it, <clears throat> you know, I shake up that jar of sand and then spread that sand over the community flat. It's just like a little quick trick to be able to disperse all that seed without like accidentally dropping it all in one area. And that's a really important thing with community flats, distribution uniformity, making sure that your seed isn't all in like one, you accidentally just dropped in one quadrant because a quarter teaspoon of W seed is like 700 plants so you got to be a little judicious really like kind of take your time and the last reason is because you're lazy and it's the fastest way to sow so that's that's a reason you can see little artemisia seedlings this was in a time when i was sowing in just a straight perlite vermiculite just all mineral which is really beneficial for some reasons but I like the performance of the BM2 more. <clears throat> I mean, for desert species, this still would be really good. I love seeing them peep through. All of my bulb seed are done <clears throat> either in BM6 or in our just nursery soil. And I sow them always in the deep flats because they, that you saw the bulbs go down really deep. So this is Calicortis catalinae, sown outside late winter, super easy bulb to grow. You can see the seed coat still kind of holding on to their classic monocot super cool you can see them just starting to come up too i love that hook as they come out of the soil you see some dudleyas tiny seed this is from this year kind of bad germination that's because january really really was quite warmer than average and that really messed up a lot of my sowings i was hoping for cooler temps uh constantia navinii this is the catalina silver lace a really um, beautiful plant endemic to the islands, really tiny seed, easier just to sow on the surface. So a species suitable for plug trays. Bunching and clumping perennials, both monocots and dicots, thinking festucas, um, any grass really, Budalua, Mulembergia, Sparabolus, the list, any grass. Uh, linum, blue flax, it's like a little cluster. It's good to have like five or six seeds in a plug, a ridge on the seaside daisy, seeds of fast growing herbaceous perennials and annuals. I We crushed the annuals this year, just sowing them straight to 72 count plug trays and then bumping them to four inch. Uh, but we do salvias, um, Sparhalsia, wow, that's embarrassing, spelled that wrong. Um, Sparhalsia, that's the desert, apricot, mallow, um, acma spawns. Acmaspawn is the only genus in the uh, Fabaceae that I don't do in deep tubes. Little fun fact. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, seeds that you may want some space apart to prevent disease, not diseases such as Areogonum, but diseases like Pythium and root rots or a foliar diseases. They get really bad um, foliar fungal diseases. So um, Areogonum buckwheat, I sow like Arborescence and Gigantium in the 72 count plug tray. That way they have a lot of ventilation around that little seedling and won't get the mildew. You have time and want to be precise. And again, that's what I said. The, the plug tray is like a lot of time. Um, and you can see some salvia spathacea germinating fat cots. I love this one. It's such a chunky little, little cute plant. It's like, a, I don't know, I need a cartoon character made out of it. 
And there's the plug tray of finished product. And that's a 72 count plug tray. It's almost as big as a liner, rose pot, the little ones see in the nursery. And you could bump this to anything or plant it anywhere, honestly, as long as you watered it sufficiently. Um, doing agave, is this is agave desert. Right? That's actually 128, it's just kind of a close up picture. You can still see kind of blurry, but the seed coat on there. All the milkweed for days, that's like three, five seeds per cell. Anyone just buy milkweed and plug trays, you'll just, it's so easy to grow. There's some spirabilis, ridei, no, aeroides, alkali secaton. It's a great grass. Everyone start planting more warm season grasses. Cool season grasses are last year. They're not cool anymore. Um, and all this stuff, all these plugs, this is current. So this is what I have growing now, which I thought for the seasonality gives you an idea of what I am growing buckwheats i'm still doing salvias i'm doing warm season grasses i'm doing milkweed i'm doing a butylon i'm doing balia um i'm doing uh datura super popular plant loves you know, sol solanums the the nightshade they love they love the spring sowing just like your tomatoes you know you can do them in a little bit earlier but they kind of come up naturally when it's a little bit warmer I did a cool species of Mirabilis. If anyone knows this one, uh, this is Mirabilis um, multiflora, the really cool big one, uh, Nitagenaceae. So uh, species that are suitable for liners, deep tubes, and larger containers. So we kind of mentioned this earlier, all my trees go in something deeper for the health of the plant, um, with the exception of Chilopsis, which we do vegetatively. Speeds with a sensitive root system, you can see the almost all species in the legume Fabaceae family, um, as well as Peritoma. I have found that that really doesn't like plug tray or a plug tray culture, so you got to sow in something deeper. Um, and if the plants are intended for restoration projects, you want as deep of a tap root as possible because watering is one of the limiting factors in successful outplantings. You can see this is a Lupinus. Um, Lupinus excubitus of uh, subspecies Ostrom Montana, the Baja species. All my lupins go in here, and then you can just outplant. And those are those are that that tube one. They're they're not that wide, but they're about four or five inches deep. There you can see a prunus illicit folia sown this year, ready to like that's as big as a one gallon is going to be from the nursery. So, and takes up less space. Although you need to buy these little trays. You can see them standing there. That's the expensive part. The can is like 12 cents. The tray is like 15 bucks. A Quercus in a tree band. See, that's the square one. Um, so timing, I only put this in because I remember last minute. So I don't have a lot of slides and we're almost out of time anyway. So timing of sowing, warm season versus cool season. So like I said, what I'm sowing right now is different milkweed species, warm season grasses, buckwheats love the summer. Um, so... A lot of stuff still going on. So pre-germination care, I know we're gonna go a couple minutes over, but we're pretty close to the end here. Um, watering, watering light, you know, you don't wanna dislodge lodge seeds. Um, you wanna water frequently, but you don't really wanna allow the media to remain super, super soggy wet. You want a little bit of wet, wet to dry swing. Think about it, you're just kind of re topping off. Um, you need to protect seeds and seedlings from birds and rodents and other hungry wildlife and observe flats regularly for dry down. And I do it by weight because visually it's not as, as specific enough. You really need to feel how much a flat weighs right after you've soaked it. So that way you can kind of measure um, what's going on. So this is just a little snapshot of like my sewing uh schedule for a, you know i just like selected a bunch of random ones from the past year um and you can kind of see what i've been referencing just take the first species sown in january dudley lancelotta in a flat seed flat number of trays two using bm6 and roughly 200 seeds per um tray i surface sowed them meaning i didn't cover them and I put them in a specific location, house one. So you guys have a PDF of like 300 different species. I'm working on a book, it's coming. Wow, that is so exciting. Great. Maybe not. Do you guys want me to just, um, how long, much longer, like two minutes?
Yeah, I mean, because of all the technical difficulties, you know, in the beginning, if you want to go for another five minutes or so, maybe until oh, yeah. 640, if you want to just keep, because it's, I mean, I'm enjoying this, so. I know, <laughs> I, I think the three hours, so it, like the seed class, so I'm like, all right, I got to condense it to one hour. How do I do it? Um, so post-germination care, and that's really like, there's a lot going on. Um, you want to water, but the wet to dry swings can be a little more severe um, to extent, whereas when you have a seed on the surface, of the soil, you know, you need to keep that moisture there. And again, that adaptation for a seed to send its root radical down to get water, you can see why you can let the surface get more dry as germination occurs. And you really want watering to be even. Some species are like, they have this um, kind of sequential germination. Most are just kind of going to flush up the same time so if it's not flushing all the same time it's uneven watering most likely um you should thin over sown flats or trays um you could do that at many different stages sometimes we'll let three plants grow in a 72 count plug tray and then just pull them out pull them apart when we're planting them up anyways the root disturbance isn't enough to hurt them again protect again observe um so this is just a little video of, okay, so you have, you know, your flat of W, you saw that, you have a little cluster, what are you going to do with them and potting something up? Sometimes I think people, it's like a little bit more like aggressive what we do, like, because we do it so often, I don't think we like think about it. Um, but you can see this is just our standard soil mix. He's, this is one of our techs, he's pulled apart the plant. You saw him fill up the cup a little bit and then make a little dibble in his hand. And then he's just packing the soil down around that plant. Um, and again, that's a couple. And here's a little video from above. So you can see he kind of like scoops in the soil, plops it down a little bit. He's kind of tussling the roots to some extent, pulling off little babies that we could plant longer. If there's too much vegetation around the base, he might pull a little bit of that off. Um, there, there was like a little leaf that was just, it was just gonna fall off and rot anyways. And so you can see he kind of holds the plant with one hand as he's tucking it in the soil around it. Now he could be bumping this to a four inch, but space is a, um, at a premium at a nursery. So we like pl planting in these little liners because we can fit 50 in a tray. You can see that flat he's working from. It doesn't even look like that many plants, but he pulled like a hundred seedlings out of that flat. Um, and then watering, you can see this is that dram. You see that red nozzle. And so there's 50 seedlings potted up, nice and aligned. They're called liners because they go in a line, whoops. Um, and so you wanna make sure you kind of like angle the water up to some degree and not just blast it down. This nozzle can also be used to water seedlings or like, uh, like the 128s, but it's just, it has a lot more volume, so it kind of, it's just less gentle. It's appropriate more for like the production st uh, stage. Um, so you can see he's really soaking it. You just really want to water things all the way through and make sure you hit all the edges um, because you want these wet to dry swings. So if you didn't water it thoroughly the first time, you have to come back the next day because part of it dried out a little bit. And you know it's wet because it's dripping out the bottom. And you can see some of them are quite small, um, but he ended up potting up, you know, a decent amount just from that flat. Although it looks like there's, a, see that one gray one on the corner? Some little rogue Dudley I got in there, or maybe it's a mutant. Um, so to kind of continue your pursuits, um, these are the places I use. I definitely buy from commercial places. And some of these I didn't list because you need to have like a wholesale license or whatever, but everything that I use can be gotten through these first three one spots. They also sell like cool kits and stuff. Some of them, you know, they're just kind of generic. One of these is owned by AM Leonard's or whatever, but um, you know, these, these are great resources. That plant and seed ID one, just to like show you guys, am I still, let's see, new share. Just to show you, this is so crazy. Um, seed 
I uh, see photos by genus. You guys see this here. So just go to any species. Just here's an acma spawn strigosis seed. That's what that looks like. It's just someone was very dedicated. This guy, John McDonald, just hats off to him because it's very tedious and very cool. So, um, yeah, guys, thank you so much. That kind of wraps it up. Sorry, it was a rocky start to get out. And I know there's a lot of information condensed. Um, should I repost that link? I know sometimes if you get in late, you can't see it. Yeah. And then for folks who want to save the chat, you can on the, if you go to the chat on the bottom right, there's those three dots and you can save the chat. But we'll also be sending out um, a follow up email with the resources that you've provided, um, along with the recording of the webinar. So I know we didn't get to nearly all the questions. There were a lot, but there was also a lot of really great discussion. And we'll send a lot of resources along with the email this time. Um, and some of them will be, you know, rabbit holes for you to fall down. Yeah. Um, so yeah. thank you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah, my email is on there. So if anyone does have specific seed germination questions or answers. <laughs> I love answers too. If anyone's like, yo, I did this and it worked of this really hard thing, please let me know. I'll put it in the book. <laughs> Credits. Well, we appreciate you, Tim. Appreciate your education and your willingness here. And you will be watching Theodore Payne Foundation. You have some exciting things coming up. Mm -hmm. So many things coming up. Yeah. And if people want to get more hands on, we definitely offer uh, a C class in person um it's a paid class but if you kind of want to get a some of this plus even more there's a lot there you can check out our website um yeah so continue to grow please if you're in southern california come visit us we're open and uh yeah thank you to cmps for having me out really excited to stuff always gets me excited to talk about seeds so uh, i appreciate you guys reaching out all right Great, and we'll see you all next month for our Naturehood gardening chats. So looking forward to, to that as well. So great. Terrific. But well, we will we'll do it next month. We have uh, dry gardens, the month after firescaping. So be on the lookout for those links. Thank you all. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Tim. See ya.